Okay, 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 okay. So I... I have no idea what that sound is, but it kind of sounds like a recycling depot is outside of my window. My ADHD is going like this. Hey guys, welcome back to another video. I am actually really excited to film this one because somehow it has slipped through the cracks even though it's been one of my most highly requested videos. Just to let you guys know, I do keep a running list of videos that are suggested by you guys and this one has been the most requested so far um, since I started my YouTube channel and for some reason I crossed this off the list thinking I had done it already but I know I have not. I scoured through my channel like five times and did not find any, so hopefully I really have not done it. So anyway, um, as you can tell by the title, I am showing you guys eight philodendrons that I have imported or that has been imported by me or someone else that I am growing here um, outside of a greenhouse. I didn't choose these eight philodendrons as like my favorite philodendrons that I'm growing or the easiest philodendrons, philodendrons? philodendrons that I'm growing, but um, I sort of picked ones that like I have found to be super, super easy. I have picked some that required a little bit more care. So I kind of wanted to give you like a good mix of both of them. I don't have a video on acclimatizing my plants out of greenhouses just yet, but I will get that up soon. But before I bring out the first plant, today's video is sponsored by Skillshare. And if you don't know what Skillshare is, it is an online learning community where you can take thousands of classes from other creators about things you're interested in or have thought of doing. Some of you guys might know this about me already, but aside from the plant hobby, I'm actually the owner of a business called Free Pancakes, a children's brand, and I make educational and creative resources for homeschool families to supplement their curriculum. I had gotten to a point where I wanted to expand my supplemental curriculum beyond what it already was, and at the request of hundreds of families, I knew that it was time to finally listen to them and take action and find a way to incorporate American Sign Language into my activities. And in that search, it actually led me to Skillshare. So with Skillshare, I basically learned what I needed at my own pace, on my own schedule, and that was super, super important to me at the time since my company was brand new and I really did not have time to take physical classes outside of my home, especially sharing a car with my husband. So these classes that were offered to me on Skillshare were so valuable. There are really cool classes you can take that range anywhere from plant styling, propagating, and even illustrating. But the class I really wanted to highlight is actually a photography class by Dan Rubin called Learn Mobile Photo Editing Apps for Beauty and Efficiency. I feel like I owe a lot of where I am now in this hobby because I was already pretty comfortable behind a camera, but I think that the image that you build for yourself on social media and wherever online is really what draws people in. And uh, in the past, a lot of people have assumed that I take my photos on a DSLR and edit on a computer program, which I do sometimes, but for the most part, I do everything from my phone and it all comes down to using the right apps. Dan's class will teach you the basics of using apps like Touch Retouch, Screw It, Snapseed, and my favorite, Visco. I know with all of the Black Friday sales swirling around, you might be tempted to splurge and bring home more things that might just end up being cluttered later. And if you've been on my channel over the last few weeks, you know that decluttering has been a bit of an ongoing theme around here. So instead, I encourage you to invest in yourself and take advantage of Skillshare's best deal of the year. For a limited time only, you can use my link to get 50% off of an entire year of your Skillshare subscription. Now on to the first plant. So the first one up is this Philodendron Billetier Black, and this sunlight is giving. I had a lot of questions about this plant when my sister first um, received it. So just to kind of give you a quick, quick backstory on this plant. Right before the space shuttle finishes hovering over my house. For the love of... 
My sister actually imported plants before I even did. And I think that she got this plant in 2000, 19 and it was much larger before but it you know it's seen better days and we thought at first that this was a I think we assumed oh so we assumed it was a philodendron billetier and keep in mind I didn't really know a ton about uh aeroids at the time especially you know aeroids that were not being grown in the greenhouses so yeah we assumed that it was a philodendron billetier it does have orange stems like the billetier, maybe not as vibrant, but definitely orange. And I don't know, I just, I saw the leaf. I was like, yeah, it seems right. But then uh, later on, people were saying, oh no, it's actually a philodendron billetier crossed with an atabacuense. And then I said, okay, <laughs> it's the hybrid. But then I started reading things online um, from people saying that, where are all these hel helicopters going? Then people online um, kept saying that that hybrid actually doesn't exist. There's no um, documentation that that hybrid has ever been created. Then I started hearing the word billetier black. And I mean, it kind of matches with the description of like, like these grooved, edges almost whereas the billete is very very like straight and narrow um it's got the sort of back like an atabapuense which is why i think people thought it was a hybrid because it literally looks oh my gosh this efn juice look i think you can see it in the sun oh never mind it looks just like an atabapuense so it's got yeah just like the darkish purple abaxials very, very sort of narrow leaf, again, with the like curly edges. And I love it. Um, I've always loved this plant when my sister had it. And in the beginning, I was just like begging for her to give it to me and she wouldn't budge until she had kids and was like, get all the plants out of my house. She still has plants in her house, but she definitely doesn't have the time that she used to. Um, so now this one's in my house. And the leaves were about this large, maybe a little bit bigger than this. And they all dropped when I brought it home. But all three of these were grown in my care and it's just literally growing on my shelf here. Um, this one has never seen a greenhouse since it was imported and it's been honestly such a trooper. It is a kind of a slow grower. It definitely does not grow as fast as my billetier and it pushes out way more EFN than my, my billy does. Let me see if I can get you a better look. So you guys can see like those little saplets. I know that EFN is like a natural process of these plants, but obviously there are no ants around here to come collect the sap. Some of my aeroids push out EFN, some of them don't. Um, for example, like my Philodendron Gloriosum pushes out so much EFN when I don't have it in a greenhouse, whereas the ones that are in my greenhouse have virtually no EFN at all. So I don't know if it's an environmental thing. I really, I have no idea. Um, I have not really taken the time to study it or even try and like conduct any experiments myself. But all I can say is that in my experience, the Billy Black has been a very EFN heavy plant. But the good thing is, is that even if there's EFN on it, like on the back of the leaves, it doesn't quite burn through the leaves like it would on like a Thaumatophyllum sanadu. Uh, and a lot of the EFN is on the petiole rather than like on the fronts of the leaves. But you'll see the very, very um, little tiny droplets on the midrib. Can you see it? Yeah. So anyway, um, that's really all I know about this plant. I don't ever have any intention of keeping this in a greenhouse. It's been such a nice one to just have on my shelf and make the shelf look a little bit more wild. If you guys have been wanting the Billy Black and don't have the greenhouse space because of the sort of way that the Billies can grow, don't even... The, don't waste your greenhouse space for a Billy Etier because they do so, so wonderful outside of greenhouses. And this is just one, maybe not the Billy Black specifically, but I will always have some kind of Billy Etier in my house on display because it would be a shame not to. They grow so well in ambient humidity, don't really have any trouble 
emerging from the caterpill and they're just really, really great plants. Second on that list is my Philodendron Mexicanum, which I actually haven't shown in a while. Just doing a quick pest inspection here and we've got spider mites. But you know what? Even when this plant gets um, some kind of pest, it just grows like a freaking champ. Look at this. Oh, I don't want to lose the leaf. It's all over this one. Um, you guys might be able to see sort of like the webbing. Can you? Or are you just looking at my face? It's like being blasted by the sun right now. Anyway, this plant has spider mites, but has not skipped a beat. It's pushing out what looks like it's going to be a pretty massive leaf. Uh, no pole or anything living in, no drainage. And it just, it's nonstop. It's a uh, loving life outside of a greenhouse. I can't remember if this plant has ever seen the inside of a greenhouse. I want to say maybe at one point it was living in my, maybe my Mills Botol when I still had the Mills Botol, but it wouldn't have been for very long just because of the growth pattern of this plant. And this one has been chopped back a few times yeah, I've always kept the top cutting, but I have chopped, you know, the the older stem away a couple times to, I sold a few, I gave some to my mom, I think I gave one to my grandma, and this one just continues to freaking just keep going. So this is another philodendron that I don't have any trouble with getting to come out of the caterpill. I think that's one thing that I really like to keep in mind when I'm thinking about the plants that... I could bring out of a greenhouse is like is it gonna give me any trouble like does it usually have trouble emerging from the caterpillar or the petiolar sheath um, does it throw a fit when the humidity drops a lot in the greenhouse so those are definitely factors that I keep in mind when I'm deciding who's gonna live just like on the shelf and who's gonna you know take up real estate in the greenhouses and I tend to sort of gravitate towards the non-velvety philodendrons for some reason. I just find that they're a lot easier, they're a lot more low maintenance, and um, it's, I don't know, they just all seem to do really well outside of a greenhouse. So this is one that I just have not really had any issues with at all, and you can see how small the oldest leaf was on this one. Um, and sort of how much larger it's gotten since then. I'm sorry if you guys aren't into the moody shadows right now, but there's really nothing I can do about the sun. So um, yeah, even without a pole, even without high humidity or high temperatures, this thing is just continuing to grow. And I know that I need to get it on a pole. I'm just, I don't know. I, I, I'm always torn between whether I want to try and pull my plants that are living out on my shelf because for this plant, my goal is never to have it become this big, massive thing that's climbing, you know, like a six foot pole. Of course, I'd love to see like how large these leaves can get, but I have this plant specifically for my shelf. So as this continues to grow and outgrow this space, I'm gonna keep chopping it back. A Mexicanum, I think, is a really underrated philodendron in general. I, I feel like it doesn't really get that much love, um, which is fine. I mean, everyone's got like their own taste, you know, but I don't know. These leaves have always been so magical to me. I love how it's like, it's got this venation that is like very, very sort of subtle, but gives it that sort of like evil look. <laughs> I love these little lobes. I love I just love everything about this plant and I love that the abaxials are like this delicious delicious um, Like burgundy color and look at how vibrant These um, uh, emergent leaves are well, that's not the best lighting maybe Okay, now I need the Sun to go away so you can sort of see here how like vibrant it is and it does sort of um as it hardens off, it becomes a little bit more muted, but um, when it's first emerging, it's just so vibrant and beautiful. And that's actually what drew me in with this plant initially. I, I think I'd still like it if it didn't have these delicious abaxials. Like you can see some of them have lost its purple almost 
completely but I just think for what it is it's just still such a beautiful plant and I, I guess I'll never really understand and I'm even talking about myself why some of these philodendrons that have like a long leaf with the, the nice little lobes get so much more love than other ones like how come so many more people have billetiers and not a mexicanum i don't know just just spitting out thoughts here i'm gonna have to move my camera back a little bit for this all right we've got big billy in the house um, i can't capture the entire leaf on camera but this is the last remaining import leaf that has been on this plant for forever i think i got this plant early Maybe like mid, I don't know, when was it Lauren? Like mid 2019 or something. I got this plant so long ago it feels like and it had two of these ginormous leaves on them and I thought honestly um, maybe a few weeks after I picked this up from Lauren that they would have died off but the other leaf only died off maybe a couple months ago and this one is still going strong. It's like not really even yellowing at all. It's had spider mites so many times and still has not given up. But you guys look at the girth of this. Oh my God, oh, it's cold. Um, look at the girth of this petiole. It is so freaking fat. I will say though that it was hilarious because going off on a tangent a little bit, but when I'm picking plants from the store or let's say I'm at a sale like an Equigenera pop-up or a Tropical Plants pop-up. I don't typically go for the plants with like the most ginormous leaves. I always look at the caterpillar. I want the plant that has the meatiest, girthiest caterpillar because that'll give me the best chance at another huge leaf because historically when I have gotten import plants, that have like huge leaves but a caterpillar like this tiny like so small the new leaf is like teeny teeny tiny and um i'm not blaming lauren at all plants are plants but when i picked this plant up it had the tiniest little caterpillar it was like this small and the newest leaf that came out on it was it was like half of this size it was so small it was like the size of my index finger so you had these two massive billetier leaves and then this little pinky of a leaf right in the center as the newest leaf so yeah i usually try and get the ones with the fatty catafil can't you jeez pervert we have grown so many new leaves since then so every single like smaller leaf you see has been grown in my care and i feel like i'm finally starting to see size again so this one is the second to newest leaf right here and you know obviously it's not as big as this guy but definitely larger than like something like this and then this one is the newest one that just opened and definitely definitely gaining some size now like I never know how to like show show size um but if you look at it next to mama mama leaf um it's about it's about half half of her size so i think even without a pole without really any special care it's it's gonna start it's gonna start getting bigger and um the stem is actually starting to thicken up quite a bit this caterpillar is getting larger and larger with every leaf and this petiole is also getting more girthy with age as well. So these are sort of things that you just want to keep looking at. Um, if you're you know, new to the hobby and you're really sort of keeping an eye on the growth of a certain plant, um, things to look at are definitely like how uh, thick a petiole is, how long a petiole is, how big a leaf is when it first emerges out of the caterpill. Um, how thick the stem is getting all of these things sort of can be an indication of like how much your plant is maturing because I feel like for a lot of plants that we have that are growing indoors it might seem like they're just sort of pushing out leaves that are the same size same size same size and never like maturing never getting larger even despite giving it a pole and all the special magical fertilizers um, some plants just take longer to size up and that's just 
how it goes. But this one has, yeah, this one's been really, really good to me since I've gotten it. It's sort of lived everywhere that I put it. And um, I have said this before, but the Billy Etier is just, it's a plant that I will never not love. Um, it gets, I mean, I think that it gets a lot of love, but maybe not as much as the variegated uh, version. I would love to have a variegated Billy Etier that's one of like my top, top wish list plants right now. And I just, don't know if I'll ever have it, but in the meantime, this one is, um, this is a close second. No, you know what? This is a first, variegated will be second. We're gonna do a quick, quick one on this one because he's been, he's been struggling a little bit, but this is my, oh, it's moss. This is my Philodendron Genevievianum, and I think I included this on my list of plants that, oh, it was the Instagram influence plants video where I talked about plants that met my expectations and plants that fell a little short. And this one was on the fell a little short list. And I won't get into the reasons why you can go ahead and watch that video. It, it had a weird thing where like some of the leaves were getting a little bit deformed. It wasn't like fully turning like that full green color. And I think Maybe it's like pest related or maybe because I had moved it out of the greenhouse, but this one has been living out of a greenhouse now for, I want to say like five, five or six months, but um, it's been pretty, it's been pretty okay. And the only thing I will say is that I've had a little bit of an issue with um, plants coming out of the catafil. You guys can see it looks a little bit bananas here right now because I have already had two leaves abort and this is <laughs> the next catafil that's gonna come out. But it's like they'll start to emerge and then I don't know if it's a nutrient thing or a light thing or whatever, but it like starts to come out and it's got its little pee, -pee sticking out and then it'll just turn pale and then just will rot. I thought before maybe it was like not enough light or something. But now I'm sort of thinking it could be like a nutrient deficiency. Uh, I have sort of been skimping on the CalMag lately or even just fertilizing in general. I, I'm i not in love with this plant, so I tend to ignore it and I tend to neglect it a little bit. And yes, I do feel bad, but I definitely give the attention to the plants that I'm really, really invested in, the plants that I super, super love. And I'm just trying to not feel guilty about it. But the only reason that I've kept this one around is because I just wanna see it through. I wanna make sure that like, I won't regret if I get rid of it once it kind of emerges out of this like weird preteen phase. I have seen a very large one um, at Lauren's and it was a beautiful plant, but again, not a plant that wowed me, not a plant that like I would have seen and been like, I need to have this plant. But I wonder if I would feel different if it was a plant that I grew from a much smaller plant. So I'm just giving it a chance. I'm trying to not really like give up on plants that quickly. I do wanna see this through, but um, if it doesn't work out, I might try and sell it. I don't I don't know if this is a plant that like my mom would be super into, but yeah, I, I wanted to include this one because it is one that I am growing out in ambient humidity, but has it has not been the easiest road for us. Next on the list, oh, I just realized I didn't move my camera back, but it's fine because this one is really big. So this is the Philodendron Serpens, and I, um, hold on, I'm thinking. I got this from Tropicals Plants. I hope I got that right. Um, Tropicals Plants, and it arrived as a pretty large specimen already. Um, that import was such a great import. Um, really not much acclimatizing that I had to do. The only thing is it did have a really, really bad um, case of spider mites. And I don't know if it still has spider mites. I've treated it a few times, but the new leaf looks pretty immaculate. It looks stunning, beautiful, gorgeous. I grew both of these leaves in regular humidity. Um, this one is just 
so much easier than I thought it would ever be. When I saw photos of this online, I was like, oh, that thing looks like it would melt in a hot second. But it's so much easier. Like it's just so much more easygoing than I ever thought it would be. And I'm so glad that I did give this one a chance because it has easily become one of my favorites. Even despite having spider mites and stuff, I still look at this plant and I'm just like, oh my gosh, I love you so much. The abaxials are just as magical. It's kind of hard to show you things without running into the mic, but these fuzzy petioles are everything. Let me bring back the genopivianum. So one of the first um, fuzzy petiole plants that I had was the philodendron squam squamiferum. And when I got that plant, I was just like, oh my gosh, this is insane, it's crazy. And the squam has very, very similar petioles to the genopivianum. It feels Id almost identical to the, um, the serpens, but obviously the serpens is a lot fuzzier, like a, the hairs are a lot longer. So when I got the serpens and the squamic wall, this just completely blew <laughs> plants like this out of the water. I was just like, well, if I could have a petiole like that, like, yeah, this is kind of just like whatever. I don't know. I fell a little bit out of love with the squamiferum because I mostly enjoyed that plant for the petiole and then you know now i'm like just the hairier the better but i think about what if and maybe there is what if there's another plant that has hairier ones than this like longer hairs than this would that make me love the serpents less i don't know interesting question the reason that i grew this plant out of the greenhouse was because I had a suggestion from someone in the comments on an older video, I think it might have been the video where I imported this, where they were like, if there's anything I've learned about the serpent and the squamaqual is that you have to grow it in lower temperatures um, and higher humidity. So I was like, okay, I can't do higher humidity and lower temperatures because I've gotten rid of all my humidifiers, all of my other greenhouses are pretty warm still. So I was like, okay, the only thing I could think of is my open XO. It's pretty much ambient humidity in there, but just slightly higher because of all the plants that are packed in there. So I was like, let's give it a go. And yeah, it's, it's worked out really great besides the fact that as soon as I took it out of the greenhouse, it got spider mites, but this new leaf seems totally fine. If you are struggling with your serpents or your squam and are noticing that maybe it's like growing a little bit funky even though you feel like you're doing everything right, yeah, I would try lowering the temperature. I never thought in a million years that this plant, like a plant that looked like this, would enjoy lower temps. This strikes me as a plant that's like, give me all the humidity and give me all the heat. But no, it, it was true, like my squam inside of the greenhouse it was, it was growing and it rooted just fine, but the new leaves were melting. And um, I noticed on this leaf as well, this older leaf, or maybe it was the leaf before this one, the um, outside, the outside edges were like just turning mushy and then just crisping off. Like it really was melting. So I have like good hopes that eventually I'll be able to grow this one maybe out here. I would love if this shelf could turn into my new aeroid shelf and I would put all of my like Ripsalis and other different kinds of plants on a different um, display area in the house. But that's for maybe a year or two from now. If I could just enjoy this one all the time, that would be such a dream. That's, that's good. I love that for me. My mom got me these, um, these wipes, these sanitizing cloths. It says it's back, a bactericidal, tuberculocidal, and virucidal. It's so strong, it burns my eyeballs. Like it feels like it would melt anything it touches. Let's get a move on on this because I feel like I've been recording for seven hours. I was pretty hesitant to include this in the list, but I didn't want to show you guys plants that were just doing great because I did want to show you sort of some of the growing pains that come with acclimatizing outside of, um, you know, greenhouse conditions. But 
This here is my philodendron patriciae. She has most definitely seen better days. I'm not even gonna say that she was growing like spectacular, spectacularly inside of a greenhouse, but she has done significantly worse <laughs> since being outside of the greenhouse, primarily because she got thrips. So you can see a lot of the thrips damage that has taken over. Um, oh, you can't really see that much there, but definitely on the front of the leaf in that corner. We had a little thrips cult gathering in this corner and they were blasted away with Dr. Doom and I laughed like a maniac and had zero remorse. But um, the cool thing is though, this leaf that has emerged, um, actually one, two, three of these leaves emerged out in um, ambient humidity, but this one specifically has a much like more matte texture to it than its other leaves. Like actually even this one has a matte texture opposed to like the oldest one that's like really, really shiny and glossy. It's sort of losing a little bit of that gloss, which is awesome because that's what I love about the mature uh, patriciaes I had mentioned in that video where I talked about, you know, the Instagram influence plants. This is one that let me down because I assumed that even in juvenile specimens that it had that sort of pillowy, fluffy, soft feel to it. And then I was, you know, kind of taken back and surprised when the plant I received was so shiny, so glossy and just like paper thin. I, I was just not expecting that. But feeling this leaf here and feeling this leaf, so the two newest leaves, um, I'm much much more hopeful that I'm going to learn to love this plant and I just need to treat it better. Again, it's one that because I have not historically loved since the beginning, I don't give it as much attention and love as let's say my like Frydeck or my Tordum or something. So yeah, I thought I saw a thrip, but um, I haven't seen thrips on this thing in a while. It's just got a lot of freaking damage. This is like the perfect, leaf to show for thrips damage there's so much of it on there but anyway yeah this is another plant that i'm growing outside of a greenhouse this one is living in that exo with the open doors again not as low of humidity as it is like where i'm sitting but still pretty low in there has had historically a bit of trouble coming out of the catafil in lower humidity so i constantly have to Make sure I'm spraying this one when a new leaf is coming or else it gets stuck, it rips, and then it just dies in the catafil. So there was actually another leaf that came after this one, but it rotted and I just plucked it and threw it away. <laughs> so now it's working on another one and it kind of looks pregognant, like it's going to push something out soon. So that's exciting, but yeah, she has seen better days. If you want a better example of this specimen grown correctly you can look at alice's hers was the bottom cutting of mine and hers is like i think it's like double or triple the size of mine already and it's growing so well she is growing hers in a greenhouse um i'm just not i'm just not willing to give up any of my um greenhouse space for this plant but i do have my hetero growing in there because i love that plant way more than i love this one nothing else really to say about this one besides also growing in no drainage um really dense uh, soil because this plant is thirsty as hell. It's got leka down at the bottom. Um, I think I repotted this one. I can't remember when I would have repotted it, but it wasn't that long ago and I've got a nice new root growing down at the bottom. So that's a sign of a happy plant. So hopefully by next year we can have a proper glow up on this because she's looking, she's looking a little crazy. Second to last plant on this list is my philodendron sp columbia and this one happens to be my favorite specimen right now out of i think i've got four sp columbias at the moment and counting um i don't ever plan to stop because i love them but i love this one because it's got this really really tight venation she's so toy and my goodness i just love it so much i if i had to only pick one sort of um, variety of the philodendron sp columbia slash silver whatever it's called 
um, I definitely would choose this one because look at how scrum dilliumptious she looks. Um, she's wet because I had treated this one for spider mites, but um, she's she's glistening. Um, I did talk about this one in my easiest philodendrons collection, <laughs> my easiest philodendrons video, and. I think this one was kind of a surprise to people because um, I had gotten comments and I had gotten DMs saying that they were struggling with theirs. But most of the photos that I was getting looked like plants that were sun stressed. Not sun stressed, am I okay? That were bleached. And I talked about that a bit in my um, video saying how this plant historically in my care, when I had it way too close to a grow light, the leaves would just completely like turn yellow around the, the edges and just have this like yellow halo. And I've had this one growing just on this shelf out here for quite some time now. And these leaves are just so beautiful and dark and are not showing any signs of the bleaching that um, my other SP Columbia's had you know shown. It does totally fine in ambient humidity. Um, light is not an issue. I have it actually all the way on the top of my shelf and it only gets um direct light for maybe like an hour or two a day but even then it's shaded by other plants and it's not getting blasted but for the most of like the majority of the day it's like this kind of lighting so not doing too bad um humidity is i don't know like 40 percent out here and she's doing just fine i have not had any issues with emergent leaves out of the catafil so I'm so stoked that I got the courage to grow this one outside of ambient humidity because if I could just have like that whole top of my shelf filled with SP Silver, SP Columbia, I would just be so happy. So if you are looking for a sign to grow your SP Columbia outside of that greenhouse, please accept this as your sign. Of course, I had to end this video with a bang and I'm going to respectfully ask you guys to not roast my lazy pole situation. This has been an overdue, complete moss pole replacement for a while and lazy is as lazy does. So here she is, my philodendron glorious on the laziest pole extension you have ever seen. Do not try this at home, children. Oh my gosh, it's going to topple over. So there she is. <laughs> um, I have a lazy pole, and then I have a lazy pole extension, and then I have another lazy pole extension. And it's just become something I am not proud of, but um, you know, you do what you gotta do, and I have done what I had to do. She is still doing okay. This, thing, this freaking stem is thick macaroni, macaroni. I'm going to back up the camera a bit because this, ca this camera, this plant is, uh, she's larger in charge. That's, I think this is the best I can do. So I don't know the last time I would have shown this plant on my channel, but we um, definitely encountered some hiccups in the transition from my plant room to it's living here now if you couldn't see it in the background but the leaves on this plant used to be like honestly pristine not that i strive for that because when you give when you put that expectation in your head you're mostly just disappointed so it was growing super super well in my plant room i went to california and that's sort of when things kind of took a dive um, I noticed that the substrate was really, really dry. I think my plant sitter forgot to water it and it pushed out all of this EFN because I believe it was really stressed out. So you can see sort of like how EFN heavy it is. There's like spots on almost every single one of the leaves. Yeah, I had thought that like maybe it was because, you know, it didn't like being moved from like higher temperatures to lower temperatures. But this one um, got attacked by spider mites and thrips. While it was sort of at the peak of its infestation, um, that's when the EFN was the heaviest. So I think that the plant was reacting to um, stress 
and being covered in these spider mites. And then I think this like sort of coppery, rusty thing could be fungal. I have said this in the past, but I feel like they're, um, like when you have a plant that has EFN, it can attract these like fungal and bacterial things that just like stick on the plant. So I do plan on treating this one with a little bit of copper fungicide this week, but I wanted to film it maybe for a week of, so I've sort of put it off. But it hasn't stopped this plant from living its best life. You can see it's kind of in the frame. Got this new leaf right here. Looks like it's gonna be a pretty decent size. Um, I'm trying to see if there's like spider mites on this plant still. Yeah, I just have to really be more, I guess, regular with the, well, with the waterings, first of all. I'm not letting it like dry out too much. Um, also making sure that the leaves are free of the EFN because the EFN just like burns through the leaves so crazy and you can just see sort of how bad it is, kind of. Ooh, I'm not, I'm not gonna try. So anyway, I of course had to feature this one and um, just show you guys sort of the product of a plant or an imported plant that can actually size up and do really well in ambient um, conditions. But I had doubts that we would get anywhere with this plant outside of a greenhouse and I only moved it out because it was just getting too tall. Really, the only thing that I would suggest is get it on a pole, get it on a pole better than this pole, get it on a pole, um, make sure that you're fertilizing those poles. I think when I repot this plant finally, which I do plan to do on camera, I think I'm gonna try a tree fern fiber pole or even a soil pole. Anywho, I wanted to end this video with my glorious because she is, I think she's my favorite philodendron. I don't know, it's a it's a really, really close tie between this and the tortum, but in terms of like leafy philodendrons, absolute favorite. So that's gonna wrap up this video. Um, those were eight plants that I have imported or that were imported by other people that I'm growing out in room conditions room conditions in ambient conditions and you know I just kind of wanted to show you the good and bad I wanted to show you how plants can react when you do grow them in ambient conditions especially during the growing pain growing pain growing growing pain period um, but it can be done and I think that if you have a little bit more time than I do to really really care for these plants during that transition period you know make sure that it's not drying out give it those regular showers just to keep pests away just to keep EFN at bay I think you can do a lot better than I can but I'm just sort of doing the bare minimum right now to be fully honest with you guys and I know I've been saying that for weeks but um, I I'm just gonna say this, I'm gonna say it. I was a much better plant parent, better. I would say, okay, I was a much more attentive plant parent before I started YouTube. Um, I don't know if you guys realize how much time um, is consumed by attempting to do YouTube. Basically full time while, while still having you know my business and a full time job. So it's been tough. But, um, you know, sometimes I wish I had these big, beautiful, magical plants to show you that I see on Instagram and other YouTubers have, but that's just not my reality. And um, it just is what it is. Pudge is dreaming right now, do you hear it? He's running. But uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it. Um, make sure you guys stick around for part two of this video while I, where I'll be showing you eight anthuriums that I imported that I'm growing in ambient conditions. So thank you so much for being here. If you liked it, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up because it helps us a lot on YouTube. I appreciate you guys so much and I will see you in the next one.